The trombone has been an integral part of the music scene for hundreds of years. In this video, we will explore a brief history of the trombone at each and every stage of its existence from its subtle evolution and construction to its practical use in music ensembles. Musical instruments have existed as long as humanity itself, but we begin our story in ancient Egypt with the oldest surviving brass instruments with two trumpets in King Tut's tomb. Fast forward a few thousand years to the Middle Ages where we get the buoy sign, a six foot long medieval trumpet used in military and ceremonial purposes. Then everyone got creative all of a sudden, marking the beginning of the Renaissance era. This gave rise to the Renaissance trumpet which was easier to hold, but they could only play certain notes and they couldn't play low notes as well. A solution to these two problems started popping up in Burgundy in the middle of the 15th century, marking the invention of the trombone. Paintings of this glorious instrument started popping up in churches everywhere. Then the trauma got famous pretty quickly and was soon used all over Europe. The earliest uses of the trauma were in court orchestras. <laughs> You can make them in several sizes including tenor, alto, bass, and even contrabass. The latter two needed handles because our arms aren't long enough. Surely someone won't come up with a solution for this, right? That's called foreshadowing. One of the first compositions written with trombone parts was written by Giovanni Gabrielli in 1597. It's the 17th century and we've entered the Baroque period of music. In 1607, Claudio Monteverdi whips up the world's first great opera and includes three trombones in the score. The first trauma and solo and quartet were also composed. In the 1700s, the trauma's relevance reached an all-time low. In an effort to stay relevant, manufacturers made the bell a little bigger to produce a larger sound. Bach used the trauma in a few of his cantatas, Handel in his oratorios, even a guy named Johann Fuchs and his Requiem. The mid-1750s marks the beginning of trauma and music you've probably heard of before. This includes the bass trauma and solo from Haydn's The Creation and Tuba Miram from Mozart's Requiem. <laughs> Alto trauma and concertos become a thing now, such as this one written by Mozart's dad, Leipold. In 1808, Beethoven uses the trauma in his symphony for the first time. but it was actually the Swedish guy who did it the year before.
but since no one knew who he was, everyone gives Beethoven the credit for doing so. Thanks to him, the trombone then became a standard in the symphony orchestra. Remember how bass trombonists needed hand slides? Not anymore. Some guy from Germany added a valve to the trombone so that you could play a B-flat trombone in the key of F with the press of a trigger. Thanks to this, low C to F is now possible. But not B. Surely no one's gonna fix this, right? That's called foreshadowing. This was not to be confused with valve trombones, which is what you get when you mix a trumpet and a trombone together. This was useful for agility, but because you couldn't perform a glissando, everyone preferred the slide trombone. Trombone virtuosos become a thing now. This guy is the most important of them because he was the first to play the famous David Concerto. <laughs> Back in the United States, concert bands started popping up everywhere, notably with Patrick Gilmore, who often featured Patrick Eines as trombone soloist. Then Patrick died, and it was then John Philip Sousa's turn to direct a great band. He later hired one of the best trombonists who ever lived, Arthur Pryor. And now that recording technology was invented, we can actually hear what trombonists sounded like back in the day. Several composers start including trauma and glisses in their music. Henry Filmer grew attracted to that and went on to write a collection of band works including the famed Lass's Trombone. <laughs> By also using it to be racist and derogatory to black people. Surely everyone forget about that over time, right? That's called foreshadowing. Starting in 1910, seeing the need to fix the missing low B, efforts to include a second valve in the bass trombone began. This was a process that took decades to refine to the point that it was consistently useful to have. Nearly 500 years after its invention, a version of the trombone was now a fully chromatic instrument. Jazz music is invented, and the trombone was at the heart of it. It's during this time where people instead of just white men would become successful playing the trombone. Woman, unfortunately not as much. Surely no woman in the future is going to help change that narrative, right? That's called foreshadowing. Emery Remington at the Eastman School of Music invents the trombone choir where everyone plays together instead of one at a time. You can make a religion out of this. Lots of trombone solos were written at this time, including the first ever sonata written by Paul Hindemith. Bass trombonists didn't have much to work with, so they just stole the tuba solos. The 
TV is invented, and if you were lucky enough, you could see the trombone on your favorite show, most notably in Trombone Trouble and the Glenn Miller story. <laughs> In the 1940s, a French horn student came up with an idea of a valve where air doesn't make a 90 degree turn. He didn't know how to make it, so he never got to doing it. 30 years later, he got to doing it. He invents the Thayer valve and everyone around the world loves it. This triggered an arms race where several others invented more valves for the trombone. In 1971, Emery Remington, the greatest trombone teacher at the time, was set to retire from Eastman. People want to honor his life by bringing every trombonist from everywhere together. This would eventually be known as the annual International Trombone Festival. At some point in time, trombone suicides and marching band become a thing, but no one knows who came up with it. <laughs> In 1982, Stanford and UC Berkeley squared off in a football game. It came down to the final kickoff where Berkeley laterals the ball five times for the touchdown. At the end of the play, Kevin Mullen smashes a trombonist oblivious to the whole situation, thus making him famous for being the byproduct of a college football miracle. And remember how I said women were getting shit for being trombonists? That changes now. In 1982, a female principal trombonist of a German orchestra was demoted to second trombone because her boss told her, we need a man for the job. This enraged her, but it took 11 years for her to plead her case in court so that her employers would stop bitching about her being a woman in a leadership position. Her story inspired many other women to take up trombone and brass instruments in general. Thanks to the internet, trombonists now have free access to many resources on how to become a better trombonist. They could now share helpful information with others on a whim's notice, allowing many trombonists to be good. The internet also gave rise to trombone memes, of which there are lots. <laughs> Imagine having to press a button to change notes. This post made by the trombone gang. YouTube is invented and Christopher Bill dominates the trombone scene with his multi-tracks because he has no friends. The Me Too movement shone a light on abuse committed by those in positions of power. Surely no trombonist will get fired over this. Damn, I didn't even get to say that's called foreshadowing. Carbon fiber trombones are now a thing. They're lightweight, but hella expensive. Every once in a while, all the trombonists from New York get together to make the most epic shit on the entire fucking planet. Coronavirus enters the chat and everyone takes lessons on Zoom. This forced trombonist to use bell covers, which really sucked, but I found this one I like, so yeah, link's in the description. George Floyd is murdered and the whole world protests racism. This prompted a trombone scholar to break the news why everyone should stop playing Lass's trombone because Filmer used it to stereotype black people. This was a big deal because everyone played the song and no one knew about its dark history. Then Pixar released Soul, where it featured the first instance of a female trombonist in the history of animation. <laughs> This was recorded by Andy Martin, but he wasn't credited for some reason. They just forgot. It's nothing, there's nothing malicious about it. It was not in our contract, although the Carpenters have it in their contract to get their name on the end credits, but it was mm. at that time it was not in our contract to get credit on the end credits. People's attention span shrank, giving rise to TikTok and YouTube shorts. Thanks to this, Trombone Tima becomes the new and improved Christopher Bell. Finance systems become decentralized, giving rise to the invention of cringeworthy non-fungible tokens. What does this have to do with trombones? This nincompoop who wept up a dozen NFTs of trombone playing, each costing $1,000, because he thinks you can make a religion out of this. Don't make a religion out of this, and instead buy a real fucking trombone instead. Last but not least, the Trombone Channel made the trombone epic. I mean, am I right or am I right?
Or was it Trombone Champ? Hit the subscribe button to learn more about the history of the trombone.